this biomechanics from cellular and structural level okay uh, thank you uh, namrata ma'am uh, aios uh, professor titial sir dr maipal sir and two good friends uh, it's nice to see uh, both of you from the, on the other side usually we keep uh, meeting in the in the different forums and i'm happy that i worked uh, with both the groups it's been wonderful learning experience and uh, wonderful talk uh, ricardo uh, my talk today is understanding biomechanics from cellular and structural level uh, i'm not go into what has already been discussed uh, i know financial interest but this is this is very important uh, which i think all of us will be wondering how safe is aerosols in post covid era uh one is that uh, you are talking about non contact tonometry so all that we spoke about uh, as the biomechanical tool in was non contact tonometry so what we did was uh, we started this uh, very exciting experiment with a group of uh, engineering scientists we ca we call it as the apier study apier is aerosol uh, projectile prediction experimental applied research uh, everything in ophthalmology today it works on aerosols and how aerosols are this is a very important video because everybody has been saying that do not uh, use uh, non contact tonometry because there are all anecdotal reports some here and say reports so we build this uh, uh, experimental model we use very very high end uh, cameras we use laser spectrography uh, and this is the same ricardo is the same place where uh, cv raman worked and uh, he built his uh, raman effect in the same laboratories so i think raman uh, 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 effect is uh, use of raman's uh, work is virtually in every domain of optics today so these uh, images you see is a non contact tonometry and this is uh, this is the whole setup we we had to do to get those high end uh, images we are looking at close to 5000 to 20000 frame per second i just spoke to abhijit and he said uh, your dsr camera gives you 60 or uh, maximum 60 of your best phones can give up to around 800 or 900 frames per second that means this goes at beyond very very high level of sync now look at this image this is a non contact tonometry let's see if there's an aerosol after say 30 40 attempts you can see that one baby drop flying off again it comes i think if you can see that one baby drop and that too after you put a lubricant so and today we repeated this again sorry today we repeated this again and this is again a very fast image you can see here hardly you can see the cornea being deformed on a non contact tonometry but you see no aerosols at all so we have to really go and figure out uh, what we've been talking about aerosols as a source of uh, uh, aerosol spread the ncet as a source of aerosol spread we have to come out with experiments which actually disproves some mythical things which we have in our mind i'm not saying that we are disproved it here but with the most best fastest cameras you don't see aerosols this is important this is good news for a lot of us because the biomechanics also uses the same principle of uh, air and how the aerosol so a lot of us were not using the uh, biomechanics because we were worried about aerosol and these images actually tell us what we want to see now coming back to my topic uh, i divided into three talks of refractive keratoconus and what is future in refractive surgery you have three things one is what you see as a clinical picture what your topography and biomechanics this have been beautifully covered by my previous speaker but this is where the whole uh, question is what is elusive how do you combine all this i'm sure we'll have a discussion with namrata ma'am and uh, dr prith professor titial sir about sometimes you know your topography says something your biomechanics says something now what do we do my question uh, to ricardo later is how do we actually analyze when all the three are not speaking the same language uh, we have all the three things you know we have professor uh, uh, renato has shown now which is a true picture and what is this gap is what we want to study so my talk today in the next 6 uh, to 7 minutes is about filling this gap and trying to have a discussion after that which i'm sure all the audience today are keen to know how do you fill in when there are few things which are not following a trend so what i did was this is something which uh, already been discussed i used the uh, different imaging i give credit to abhijit sinha both ricardo and uh, 
Graham Bresio has worked with him. He built this imaging system to look at the collagen. These are pixelated images of uh, collagen reflectivity using the polarization. And this has been my domain, uh, how the molecular structure match. What I try to do is if I combine all the three, what picture am I getting? So that probably would under, make me understand. One is your uh, tomography. One is actually studying your collagen. And the third one is actually doing something similar to your histopathological examination and seeing how your collagen is. And that is what your biomechanics is at the end of it. So what we did was, uh, this is uh, something which uh, was built in-house with the help from uh, University of Vienna. It works on the polarization sensitivity. You have a uh, imaging... Uh, 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 resolution of around two to two and a half microns is what we are seeing. That's one of the best, finest resolution of OCT uh, commercially available. And uh, this is a work by Keith Meek and show how the collagen that you can see that the stronger here, different, uh, it's like a pillars and the center is completely different. And that's how the collagen is. And we were able to see the same kind of picture when we actually do the polarization sensitive OCT of the collagen structure. So, and this is a retardation map of how the collagen is oriented. So what happened was we started looking at everything in a different way now. For example, we have a topography. We have to, the polarization velocity which looks at the collagen and we have the indices. Now, this patient has a small area of weakness here. I'm sure uh, there's a difference of uh, 1.5 adapters of superior uh, inferior. And what happens is some of your indices are still showing normal. This is something which I want to ask Ricardo. Uh, why is the indices showing normal when you see that there is some amount of changes here? And this is where the confusion for the clinician is. So when we did a PSOCT, the polarization sensitive OCT, you can see that that collagen in that zone matches to this area. There's some amount of degradation. You can match it with this and this. So that means there's some degradation happening but maybe it's not picking up. And this is something, and this compared to how a normal uh, PSOCT is. And here also, what you see is that this is very interesting. Your topography looks normal, but look at this here. Your CBI is abnormal, your uh, TBI is abnormal, and your bad D is in the center. So what's interesting in this picture is the whole of cornea is actually not uh, showing good uh, images of collagen. The collagen is poor. This is where I think my talk comes into, where you're combining two things and trying to understand what happens. This is what uh, Namrata ma'am can be used for discussion. And this is 99% of the questions uh, who are using this technologies. Why does indices sometimes don't match to what you're seeing on your topography? That's because the collagen is completely different. And this is good news for Ricardo because your CBI is showing abnormality even though your topography is showing is normal because I think the collagen itself is completely abnormal out here, which is proven by the, the PSOCT picture. And uh, this is the typical thing when you know you have multiple... Uh, uh, combination. I'm, I'm, I'll use this for the discussion because this is what I think a lot of questions will come. Why sometimes there are multiple permutation and combination of this. And uh, when I use the uh, polarization OCT, it more or less matched to whatever Ricardo was saying. The polarization actually matches to collagen and your indices are all looking only at the collagen uh, synthesis. So that means there is confusion, but if you really look deeper, you probably find an answer. For example, let's look at these cases. Uh, not something great topography. There is some amount of scheming. Uh, you can see that uh, some bad D is changing. There is a bad D changes, some TBI, and sometimes even these things are showing as normal. But when you look at your collagen, you see that there is a loss of signal from these zones out here. There's a lot of, uh, and only the central looks healthy because a lot of zones don't match up. So uh, Ricardo has shown this, that is a beautiful uh, software which tells us when the cornea is becoming thicker. Now, the question is, is it really becoming thicker or stronger, sorry, or is it just a mathematical change? So what we did was the same patient, we did a uh, polarization sensitive OCT of pre-op, we can see that the collagen is uh, poor. And the post-op, you can see that there's a huge lot of changes which has happened here. We even did a topographic treatment, but you can see that the collagen is much different from what it was on the pre-op. And the same patient actually 
was showing stiffer on this. So that means whatever he showed as the cornea becomes stronger is actually proved by the collagen changes out here. So how do we move forward? What are the future uh, technology, future things? For example, the same patient here. One of the best ways to study we thought was uh, taking the smile lenticule. Because when you take out a smile lenticule, you actually get a tissue. So what we did in this patient was basically the same patient who had a poor uh, a collagen on uh, the OCT and your indices were also abnormal and they were showing difference. That patient, we did a smile extra on it, but we had the lenticule. And when we took the lenticule, lenticule is like a pen drive for us, for a scientist, because you plug the pen drive, you get virtually everything you want. So what we did was we started looking at collagens and we started looking at multiple things. So what happens was in this patient uh, who had a lower uh, uh, biomechanics, you can see that his uh, lysyl oxidase level was good, uh, but his uh, collagen was also not as good as it should be. So that means that what was what the indices were showing was kind of matching to what the patient actually had structurally. So that means even though there is confusion, I'm sure this debate will go on, there is a lot of uh, truth in what the machine is giving. Only thing is our understanding has to become more uh, advanced. And this is the same patient who underwent the smile surgery. We always, this lenticule, we can study. And this is, this is the most important uh, thing for us because virtually you can get everything out of it. And we did an extra. You could see that by doing an extra on this patient, it actually became stronger. So I, I believe that there is some role of extra, especially in a smile patient. And you can see that in this patient, uh, the, the, there is a different level of each patient's lenticule shows different things. For example, here, the collagen and the LOX levels are completely different. And especially in this patient's, that's very low levels. And this matches with your bad D. And even though the topography is normal, it matches with your uh, your parameters. So means that means that when I combine all the three together, your imaging of collagen, your topography, your indices, and your lenticule, I think a picture emerges. So that I'm not saying that everybody should do this, but what happens is we can give a suggestion that this is why this is this is how it is. And uh, finally, what based on future, uh, we did some experiment about genes which can cause ectasia between LASIK and SMILE. And uh, this was an experiment on uh, donor eyes, and we found that the genes which can which works on healing with LASIK is completely different from what happens in SMILE. So that is the reason your SMILE-driven ectasias and the LASIK-driven ectasias, post-LASIK ectasias, do not always match in the same way. Uh, they're completely different because you are genetically, these two are, this is all original work and we're just uh, about to write this up. This is the gene which is there in LASIK and this is the gene which is there in uh, a SMILE. That means that when you get an ectasia and SMILE which is completely different and not following a pattern, you have to understand that the genetic uh, way of ectasia in SMILE is completely different from what you see in a LASIK and uh, LOX is one of them and in LASIK it was at the Nerves. So these two things, what is what I mentioned, and these two have a huge implication in understanding the biomechanics also, because uh, there, there's a huge genetic component of how the collagen stroma is structured. And if you are um, if you are doing a smile or a LASIK, it's going to be completely different. It's, it's completely a different uh, subject altogether, and we may need a long time to discuss. But I'll be open to any questions on this particular uh, subject. To sum up. Uh, under biomechanics should never be looked at it from one dimension. It, if you have to look at biomechanics at one dimension, you'll always have more confusion. I think it has to be looked at it at multiple levels and then integrate it and probably discuss about it. There are, we are working on a differential corvus where we look at different zones. Uh, Brillio microscopy is one and you have to bring in biomarkers at some point of time, hopefully, uh, which will help us to understand this better. Thank you.